Now assuming that we understand our anatomy, we're going to approach the physiology of the heart by analyzing an EKG. Now most people hear EKG and they ought to think, my gosh, that's got to be complicated because I go to the doctor and they run an EKG on me and somebody special has to read it. We're not going to learn how to read them in huge detail. We're going to look at what a normal EKG graph looks like and talk about how it could vary in some very simplistic ways. Now, if you actually have a doctor reading your EKG, they're going to be able to see much more detail from it. And what later classes don't think, gosh, she lied to us. No, I mean, we're just going to do the basic part of it. Okay? Every EKG, cardiogram, okay, first let me say an EKG and an ECG are exactly the same thing. Why well, have two different names for it? Because people thought the ECG abbreviation was hard to say. So they started calling it an EKG, but it's just an electrocardiogram. The way they take an EKG, they hook electrodes up to your body, and they monitor electrical impulses from your heart. Okay? When they do this, you get a repeating pattern. You always get this same little pattern right here repeating over and over again. First you get one small wave, then you get a more complicated wave that has three parts to it, then another small wave. This was a true EKG. You would see this pattern, then right after it you'd see that pattern again. Okay? What do you think that whole pattern represents? Your heartbeat, one entire cardiac cycle. All right? That means your entire heart is going to beat and relax within each one of those. Okay? Everybody's with me so far, right? We give them abbreviations or we give them names. We call the first wave the P wave. Then we have what we call the QRS complex and then the T wave. Okay? Now, do you, a little bit last time when we talked about muscles, we looked at the graph of a muscle contraction. When you went up on this graph, what was happening? You were depolarizing, right? The muscle was depolarizing. When the muscle depolarized, what was it doing? Contracting or relaxing? Contracting. Okay? So we're going to kind of see the same thing here, except you have to remember this is going to be more complex because this is a large organ and several things that little all of them going up. That's why I have some of them going down. Okay? So when we looked at the electrical activity in the heart, we said right up here in the top right-hand corner of the right atrium, we have a little set of cells called the sinoatrial node. Right? The other name for the SA node was the pacemaker. That is where you initiate contraction of muscles. Right? So if I initiate the contraction of my muscles in this upper hand, right hand corner of my right atrium, what's going to contract first on my heart? The atria or the ventricles? The atria are going to contract first, right? And that's why you see this first little wave on your graph. This P wave occurs because your SA node has fired and you have started contracting your atria. So that P wave represents atrial depolarization. We all remember depolarization means muscle contraction. Okay? So if you look kind of cool, the heart contracts the right atrium contracts slightly before the left atrium, then the ventricles contract. So it's kind of a pattern like that. Okay? So our first wave, atrial depolarization. After our SA node contracts, that gets our H after our SA node fires, we get our atria to contract. And then we have another little set of cells that send a new signal or amplify the signal. And this is called your A V node. The AV node is the atria and the ventricles. Okay? When your AV node cells are beginning to fire, you're somewhere between the P and this QRS. You're getting ready to have the QRS complex. When this AV node fires, that sends the signal all the way down through the interventricular septum, and we get this crazy looking QRS complex. So the QRS complex is going on as the signal comes down through your bundles 
that are running down in between the interventricular septum. Okay. So if I have cells down here all around my ventricle firing, what is my ventricle going to be doing? Contracting. So the QRS complex is where our ventricles are depolarizing. Our ventricle is contracting. But why is it so crazy looking? See, our P was just a normal depolarization wave, right? Why is the QRS down, up, down? There's two reasons. Can you guys figure that out? It's contracting a lot harder. Very good. Reason number one. Why does this look so crazy? You see how tall that R peak is? The ventricles contract with a whole lot more force than your atria contract. The muscles are bigger. They have a lot more work to do, right? They've really got to contract to be able to force the blood out the larger veins out to our body. Very good. What's the other reason the QRS looks so crazy? Okay. Atria contracted. Now our ventricle contracts. What's our heart doing? It can't do anything now, right? What does our atria have to do before anything else can happen? Relax. Would it make sense for your heart to contract, contract? Relax, relax. That takes a lot longer, right? Your heart, the atrium, the atria contract, your ventricles contract, and while the ventricle is contracting, your atria are relaxing, getting ready for the next step. So actually, the QRS complex, there's two things going on at the same time. Major thing is your ventricles are contracting. At the same time, your atria are relaxing. Does that make sense? If you think about what the cells are doing at this time, SA node went, AV node went, now our bundles are firing, right? These aren't firing anymore. So our atria are starting to relax because the cells inside of our atria, they're not firing, they're not doing anything anymore. Okay? Ask it. Atria are relaxing, relaxing. Okay, so if we go back through the beginning, let's make sure everybody's with me. So first thing that happened, our SA node fired, our atria contracted, right? Then our AV node fires, gets our ventricles ready. We move down the bundles. Then our ventricle starts contracting. At the same time, our atria is relaxing. Now we've got relaxed atria, contracted ventricles. Now what do we have left to do? We need to relax our ventricles. How many waves do we have left on our graph? Right, we did P. We did QRS. What's left? It represents your ventricle relaxing. Now this is the crazy part. Why? It's kind of hard to explain, but that bothers some of you because you, you want up to be contract and down to be relaxed. It's not quite that simple. A lot of it has to do with where they put the electrodes on the body. And also because the ventricle has just contracted so strongly, it kind of throws the electrodes in the machine kind of out of whack in a way. So what you end up with is an up graph for your relaxation. But what's going on during the T wave is you're relaxing. Okay? So let's take this a little further. Let's think about it a little harder. And when we're up here, during the P wave, valves are open. And what valves are closed? Are they all closed? Are they all open? You have a question? Okay, ask your question first. Both sides. The right side does contract slightly before the left. But by the time the atria are done contracting, they have, they have synced up. The ventricles contract at exactly the same time. The only reason your right atrium contracts slightly before your left is because your pacemaker is in your right side. So it takes us just a, a 0.1 milliseconds for that left side to catch up. Okay? Good question. What valves are doing? All right. So during the P wave, our atria are contracting, right? So what is our blood trying to do when our atria are contracting? Everybody think. If our atria contract, where's our blood going to go? It's going to go down into our ventricles, right? Do we want the blood going the opposite direction? Of course not. So if we are contracting our atria and trying to get the blood to flow down here into our ventricles, do we want our tricuspid and our mitral valve open or closed? Open. That's actually one of your driving forces that actually opens the valve. When the atria, before the atria contract, those valves are closed. The blood is pooling inside of your atrium. 
when there's enough in there, the atria contract and squeeze that pops that mitral or tricuspid valve open and the blood flows into your ventricle. Does that make sense? Okay, so here we go. sorry, it's not I don't know if you're gonna be able to read this because it's way off. I need to calibrate it. So here is when we're gonna have our A V valves open. Okay. That's atrioventricular valves. Your tricuspid and your mitral are both A V valves. Everybody understands that, right? Okay. So this is when we gotta have our A V valves open during both of these. Here and here. Here and here. A V valves have to be open because our atria are contracting. Would our SL valves, would our semilunar valves be open or closed at this point? Okay, so what is our blood trying to do? Always go back and trying to go from our atria to our ventricles, right? Do we want it leaking out of our ventricles and just slowly moving out? No, what do we want to do? We want to pull it in our ventricles. So we can contract and shoot it out, right? We don't want it just to just leak out a little bit. We want it to come out with force, okay? So would our SL valves be open or closed? They're closed right now. Okay, very good. Now we move a little further and we're down here in our QRS complex. Our ventricles are going to contract and our atria are going to relax. What's going to happen to the valves in our heart? The AV valves have to close, correct. Why do our AV valves have to close? Gosh. So the blood does not go back into the atrium. Perfect answer. And they can't read that. That says AV close. The pen's crazy. Okay. So our blood our ventricle is going to contract. When our ventricle contracts, we want our blood to shoot out our pulmonary artery and our aorta, right? If we leave our AV valves open, what's going to happen when our ventricle contracts? It's going to leak back into the atria. That's backflow. We never want our blood to go the opposite direction. So when our ventricle contracts, our AV valves slam shut. That is the first sound you hear when your heart beats. When you listen to a heartbeat, you hear ba bum ba bum right? They call it the rub dub of the heart because the first sound's a, not quite as strong of a sound. It sounds more like a lub. That is the AV valves shutting. They don't shut with quite as much force. Okay, so at this point, our AVs have to close. What do our semilunar valves have to do? They have to open, right? Because there's blood shooting out of here. If these stay closed, our, we're squeezing and the blood has nowhere to go, right? So our SL valves have to open. Very good. Okay. The AV close before the SL open. Very, very slight difference in time, but there is a slight difference in time. Okay. So now we get down here to our T wave. Our ventricles start to relax. What are, val what are our valves going to do? Which ones close? The SL has to close, right? When our ventricle contracted, it shot the blood out our aorta and our pulmonary artery. Well, our ventricle now relaxes. The blood is going to want to do what? leak back down, right? So we have to slam those SL valves shut to make sure they catch the blood and it can't come back. So that's when you hear your second heart sound is when those SL valves slam shut. Okay? So the actual sound that you can hear, and we have stethoscopes in the lab. I forgot to get them out last time because I had that meeting, but we can get the stethoscopes out if you've never actually listened to what your heart sounds like. You can clearly hear two different sounds, and that's the valves closing. Okay, so here's when our SL are going to close. As soon as we get through our T wave, we come back up to the top. We start again. AV valves are going to open. Atria to contract again. Does that make sense? Go for it. When the SL valves. No, it's, I mean, I was just trying to go in order. It's not necessarily once it relaxes. As soon as the AV closes, the SL opens. Okay, I see what you're saying. I didn't necessarily mean to write it where it was talking about the depolarization was complete. It just has to happen in this order is what I meant. Okay. 
So now let's see if we can think about a few things. So if I have, so if this is my regular graph, okay, I have my P, my QRS, and my T. What is wrong with my heart if instead of having this normal looking graph, I have my P looks right, and then it takes me a, a long time. Okay, so everybody sees the difference? It takes a long time to get from P to R. So let's see if you understand. What could make it take a long time to get from P to R? The technical way of saying it is an extended P to R interval. Okay, but I don't care if that's technical way or not. All right. So we just had P. P is normal. So that meant our atria were able to contract just fine, right? Okay. What would make it longer to get to R? What's happening as we get to R? The ventricles are contracting, right? So it's taken us a longer period of time to get from the atria contracting to the ventricle contracting. What could be wrong with my heart to make it do that? What could slow the down that process? Which valve? What's wrong with my AV valve? It didn't open properly. If my atria contracts and my AV valve is what they call sticky, it's not going to open as much. So it's going to take longer for my blood to flow down from my atria into my ventricle. That a lot of times will happen with age, with bacterial infection in the heart, or with um, plaque buildup in the heart, fat buildup in the heart. Those valves will get sticky. They lose that elasticity. They can't pop open and shut quite as much. So when people are having any type of issue and they go and they look at the EKG, if they see it stretched out, that tells them, up oh, there's a sticky valve. It's not opening quite as much as it needs to. Does that make sense? Okay. They do. They have surgeries where they will go in and they can repair valves. They can replace valves. They put valves from other animals into humans. We put pig. We put monkey. Mainly pig because pigs are really genetically similar to humans. <laughs> as horrible as that is to accept, we're most genetically similar. Well, the cows are bigger. That's why I don't use cow a lot. Oh, that's the, see, I don't do that a lot. Mm -hmm. They they use pig more often than anything. So, that I, but I don't know enough about it to be able to tell you why they chose to use cow. So they use pig more than anything. Uh. Well, so think about it. Why why would a cow's blood be thinner than a human's blood? Well, common sense. What's a cow's blood got to do that a human's blood doesn't? Who's bigger? Cow. His blood's got a lot further to go, right? The more viscous something is, the slower it moves. So a cow's blood's got to be thinner than yours. That's why their valves look different than ours. Okay? All right. So does everybody understand that? Here's the way I look at extremely complex questions on a test where I ask you to evaluate an EKG. You're not doctors. The reason I go through this is I think that if you can understand what the change in it means, then you really understand what's going on. That, that's why we go through this. So don't look at this and think, oh my god, I'm not sure I can read the EKG. That's not the point. The point is that you can follow along and understand what we're saying. Okay? So that's what it would look like if we have a sticky valve. Um, so if I sit down and I calculate how long it takes me to get from P to the next P to the next P, what does that tell me? What's a common vital sign? We take it all the time. It's your heart rate, not your blood pressure. We're going to talk about blood pressure hopefully later today. That's your heart rate. How long it takes you to go through one complete cardiac cycle. Okay? If I go to the doctor and they do my EKG and they take several of your EKGs and we compare them, are we all going to have the same P to P interval? Of course not. 
some of it's genetics. Some people have a higher heart rate than other people do. I have an extremely high heart rate, which shouldn't surprise you because I'm always just kind of antsy and going. When I work out, my heart rate gets up to 180, 190. For some people, they would, that would mean you need to stop, right? So everybody has a different heart rate. just depends on the person. We had a big debate over the summer um, whether you could change your heart rate or not. My belief is not much. You may be able to change it a little bit by exercising, but I exercise a lot. Right? So you can't really slow your heart rate and improve your overall heart health by exercising. Exercising does improve your heart, but not, it doesn't slow it down. Most of that is genetic, how fast your heart beats. Okay? I mean, you can argue in if you want to. That's my belief. Okay? All right, so next let's think about another modification. Oh, okay. I'm looking at y'all's piece of paper because I don't remember what I wrote. So remember the orange one on the board is normal. Here's looks like this. What just happened? All the peaks got bigger, right? I know that would scare the heck out of me. That looks the worst, right? <laughs> That's actually not the worst thing you could see, but it's not necessarily a good thing. What does that mean? All of your peaks are higher and lower. What's your heart doing? It's beating really, really hard, right? Instead of the muscle contracting like normal, normal intensity, the muscles are intensely contracting. What, what's wrong with you? Why is your heart beating so hard? There's more than one reason. Why would your heart be beating so hard? It's working harder to push the blood out. So what could be wrong with your blood? Your blood could be too thick. It could have lots of cholesterol, lots of fat in it. So your heart is just having to work like crazy to get that blood moving normal. What, what else could be wrong? Your blood pressure, what's wrong with your blood pressure? Okay, how could too high blood pressure make your heart have to beat harder? I'm not saying you're wrong. I want you all to think. Can I help her? If, you're, if your blood pressure is high. Okay, that's not beating harder. That's beating faster. Okay. Actually, more of your intense heartbeat is going to come from low blood pressure. So why would low blood pressure make your heart beat harder? It's got to work harder to build up enough pressure to get your blood to do what? Go, right? If you have high blood pressure, your, your blood is actually keeping the pressure in the arteries and the veins good enough already. Your heart doesn't have to work quite as hard to get it there. If you have low blood pressure or low blood volume, all of a sudden your heart is just beating like crazy trying to get that blood to go. So that's another reason you can have a really, really um, high voltages. Now, I wrote on your little sheet of paper, a lot of times when you have that constant high voltage, now a lot of us are going to have high voltage when you go to the doctor just because you're nervous and your heart just starts beating a little harder. And, but, I mean, we're talking over long periods of time, you constantly see that much higher voltage. We call that ventricular hypertrophy. hypertrophy. What does that mean? What does hypertrophy mean? Hyper means? bigger, the heart physically gets bigger. Why would your heart beating harder make your heart get bigger? Squats for two hours, what's going to happen to my leg muscles? They're going to swell up and get bigger, right? If your heart sits there and physically beats harder and harder and harder for a long period of time, your heart will get bigger, which may sound like a good thing at first, like bigger heart, pump more blood, good thing. Not a good thing. Okay. Your heart is a slightly different type of muscle, and your heart can wear out if it gets too big. It loses its ability to pump quite like it's supposed to. Okay. I don't know if I know the answer to that. Because um, it just depends on, that's just somebody saying that. Like, I don't know if that, like, that's not a true clinical term. So I don't know exactly what was meant by that. Probably more that just the cells aren't functioning like they're supposed to. Um, so the next thing to talk about, we're going to talk about is what does it mean if you're, you don't have quite enough voltage, meaning you, instead of having a normal peak, you've got shorter peaks. 
that a lot of times signals myocardial infarction, which is the cells aren't pumping like they're supposed to. And if somebody, oh, wow, the nickel bag in there. All right. If you flatline, what does that mean? Well, you're not, you may not stay dead, but if you flatline, the heart didn't beat, right? So if you have really, really small peaks, that may make you have a heart attack. The heart attack may be your heart trying to reset. If you do that too many times, certain parts of your heart may lose the ability to ever contract again. And that's probably kind of what you're talking about. But here's the problem. I have with doctors. A lot of times they try to simplify things. So it sounds like something a doctor would say that this part of the heart died. I mean, that's not really what happened. So it's hard for me to kind of guess what that really means. Well, what, what it, he was having continual heart attacks. He was having myocardial infarction one right after another. So meaning his heart was not pumping the way it was supposed to. And once you get it too out of whack and if you lose your voltage connections in your heart, it will no longer be able to communicate. And so that's just a slow motion. Yes, ma'am. Jen. So what does decreased voltage signify? It's not beating hard enough. It would either, well, it could be the blood would be too thick could make that happen. Plaque buildup, fat buildup, um, atrial infarctions, those heart attacks. A lot of it has to do with the electrical parts of your heart not working right. Like your SA node is not firing correctly or your AV node. That's when people have to have things like pacemakers put in, which the pacemaker we talked about last time, I think. The pacemaker is a little, basically a little set of batteries that shock your heart right here. So that instead of your heart naturally initiating the shock at the top, you have something artificial that shocks your heart when it's supposed to. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Okay. They don't wait until the heart completely goes out to do pacemakers and replacements and things. They that that wouldn't make any sense, right? Once they start, if you have a heart attack, they hook you up to an EKG and they watch it and they look for common things in your EKG. stays low voltage or if the voltage is just every now and then it just kind of goes crazy and then it gets back on track, that's when they'll say, okay, maybe you do need a pacemaker. You need something to keep it on a normal rhythm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, that's looking at brain waves. So it's a, I mean, it's a little different. That's looking more at making sure that all the different parts of the brain are functioning properly. But all of the waves, anything similar. It's got a different name. I didn't know you had a question. I'm sorry, I thought you were stretching. Mm -hmm. That's, that's what that thingy is. That thing they wrap around you when you're in labor, it's, mon it's taking an EKG of the baby's heart. Okay? They also stick something inside of you that clips into the baby's scalp, which sounds mean, but it's not. I mean, barely get it. It clips into the baby's scalp, and it monitors the baby's heart rate. And they watch it. When they say the baby's heart rate is dropping, then they have a PQRST. Wait a while. Another PQRST. The baby is not, their heart's not beating as fast as it needs to. It means your labor is not progressing fast enough. That stupid thing around your waist is why they want you to lay in the bed. There's no reason you should have to lay down while you're in labor. That's just, they want you to lay down so they can hook you up to all the machines to monitor you. You feel a lot better if you get up and walk around. Uh -huh, go for it. Well, that's when myocardial infarction or infarction is when a certain part of the heart does not 
function the way it's supposed to. It, does, it can be any part of the heart whenever you have that issue, which is what we were talking about with when some people will say, it's not really dying, it's just stopping the function, and you've got to get it back into rhythm. If you're lucky, you can have a heart attack, you can have an issue somewhere in the heart, and the heart will correct itself. So if you ever, I mean, we've all probably in the next 10 years, right, never had surgery, never had anything happen. Maybe they started a little healthier lifestyle, but that's because the heart can correct it. And then you have people like um, Michael Clark Duncan. Y'all know who that was, right, the, the guy, the actor from the Green Mile, giant black guy, right? He started out as a um, bouncer for celebrities. He had a heart attack at 54 and just dropped dead, right? So let me, let me see how smart you guys are. Yeah, like last week, that was a really, really big guy, right? What could have possibly been wrong with his heart to make him just drop dead? What could have made his heart too big? Most of the time, you don't get muscles like that naturally, right? Now, I don't know him, but it's very possible he took things to help make his muscles bigger. When you take steroids that make your muscles bigger, it makes that heart bigger. And a lot of big muscles, it's because they've taken steroids. No. Steroids don't shrink the penis. Steroids shrink the scrotum. The only reason the penis looks smaller is because everything else looks bigger. <laughs> Which may sound funny. <laughs> but <laughs> if you have something that's a certain size, and then all of a sudden everything around you gets larger, it's going to look smaller. Yeah. But it can have something to do with losing the ability to get an erection. Which, I mean, is when it's going to be biggest. I knew the answer. All right, we got one more thing to think about. All right, a prolonged QRS complex. So that means this QRS is really stretched out. What's happening during the QRS? Ventricles contracting. So what's your blood trying to do when your ventricle contracts? Shoot it out here, right? Okay. What could be wrong? Let's see how smart you are. All right, it's a valve issue, but it's not the SL valve. What could be wrong with my AV valve? It didn't close. It stayed open. Anybody ever heard of a mitral valve prolapse? That's when this side of the heart, this left side of the heart, that mitral valve prolapses down. It's leaky. So when the ventricle contracts, blood goes backwards. So it takes it longer to really get the blood out in the body like it's supposed to. Why do you think we hear about mitral valve prolapses and not tricuspid valve prolapses? The left side's bigger, got a lot more work to do. Very good. Y'all seem like y'all understand. No, no. Left side's bigger. <laughs> left side's bigger. I hope y'all understand. Y'all surprise me sometimes. Okay. All right, so last thing to discuss here is what we've already talked about. It's just putting it into the correct cardiac cycle terminology, okay? So true terminology right here at the top of the screen. So how do you think you pronounce this? Systole. Have you ever heard systole? Have you ever heard of somebody being in asystole? So y'all are a little younger than me. I didn't watch ER. That was a really popular thing when I was in high school. Right? You ever hear somebody's in asystole? What's wrong with them? Bad, right? They're calling codes. They're in asystole. That means their heart is not contracting anymore. Systole is the proper term for a heart muscle contraction. So how do you think you pronounce this one? Diastole is the proper term for a heart relaxation. Well, I mean, you could pronounce it anyway, just like you could pronounce, you know, yeah, tomato, tomato. Yeah, I mean, you could pronounce it however you want to, but you just usually hear it pronounced systole and um, diastole. I would never correct you if you said systole or diastole. I just want you to know what it means. Okay? All right. So what they do when they discuss the cardiac cycle, they just pick a place that they start and they go through because when you end, you just go back up to this top and start again. Okay. So they chose their first phase in your textbook of the cardiac cycle to be ventricular filling. So when the ventricle is filling, let's see if we can predict what's happening. What's the blood doing? It's going into the ventricle. 
as it's going into the ventricle, which valves have to be open and which valves have to be closed. AV has to be open, SL has to be closed. Which part of our heart are we going to see a systole or a contraction? Atrium or ventricle? Atria has to come. It's just slowly starting to come down. AV valves are open. That atria does what? It contracts and says, get on with it. Shoots all the blood down in the ventricles. Now we're ready to leave ventricular filling and we can go into ventricular systole. That is when the ventricle contracts. So when the ventricle contracts, which valves are open and which valves are closed? AV has to close. SL has to open. What does the blood do? Shoot out of the heart. Now we're done. We're ready to go to isovolumetric relaxation. Now our ventricles are going to relax. Our SL valves are going to close. And we're getting ready to start over again. And we pick right back up. Not, it's, it doesn't happen at exactly the same time. But it's, you know, it does open before the atria contract. So the SL valve closes and then I don't know how long it is, but 0.1 milliseconds later, the AV starts to open. Correct. Correct. Okay. Now, is this exactly the same thing that we were just going over the steps of here? Yes. This is just, we were looking at it from the standpoint of this is what an EKG graph looks like. And now I was just going through with you from your textbook. This is what they consider a cardiac cycle. They just pick the place to start and they go through the steps. So it's exactly the same thing. I just personally think it makes more sense when you look at the graph, the EKG graph. That's why I like that. Does anybody have questions? Does that make sense?